Good morning. Thank you all for attending. Um, good to see you. Um, we will go through our agenda. Um, first item is approval of the October 7th minutes. Hi, uh, Russell Barksdale, make a motion to approve. Second. All, all in favor? Here. Aye. Unanimous. Thank you so much, Alyssa, for another great job with the minutes. Um, next item, reports, Health Department, Jen. Jen Eilson, Director of Health. Um, okay, we'll start with COVID update. So our current vaccination numbers, ages 12 to 17, we're at 98.24%. 18 to 24, 100%, 25 to 44, 100%, 45 to 64, 88.89%, 65 and over, 100%. Uh, percent of total population with at least one dose, which this includes all those that are currently not eligible. So total population, we're at 80.12%. Percent of total population fully vaccinated, we're at 72.9%. Total doses um, administered by the health department to date, 15,012 doses. Uh, today we have a booster clinic um, of Moderna and Pfizer. We have 350 registered. Bethany, thank you for helping out and Harrison today. Um, Our pleasure. <laughs> Um, on November 11th of next week, we're doing the, we start the youth campaign of the ages five to 11. We have a thousand kids registered. Registration is full for the public school clinic from three to eight. On November 10th, the day before um, at the high school, we're gonna do teacher booster clinic and set up for the next day and keep everything there to minimize the Thursday you know, workload. On and, seven. and how are the teachers doing in terms of their degree of vaccination? Do we know? That no, it's in the 90s. Brian puts it in his Board of Ed reports. Okay, thank Cause, you. Because under the um, governor's executive order, those that are not vaccinated have to submit to weekly testing, which Brian has to submit to the state as well. Um, so the, their numbers have gone up, obviously, from the governor's order as well. In, in people that not wanting to do the weekly testing. The same has happened on our end. We're not under governor's order, but the town um, said, if you're not vaccinated and you work for the town, whether you're a town employee, police, fire, whatever, if you're not vaccinated, you have to get tested every week. And it's helped increase our numbers as well. On the 17th, um, we're gonna do the country school clinic at the country school. That registration's already gone out as well. Um, we have 210 registered for that out of the 360 kids. Uh, St. A's will be after Thanksgiving due to the scheduling. So that will be Wednesday, December 1st. They haven't sent out any communication yet. They only have 100 kids actually in that um, age bracket. So that will be easy compared to <laughs> the public schools. And, um, and Jen, Jen, a number of those are Norwalk and other towns residents. Um, how does that play with this? We just do them anyway? Yeah, because the school is in New Canaan. But um, so testing update, we have to, from since August, once we started with Waveney, so thank you again to Russ and Waveney. Um, we've done 732 PCR tests. Rapid tests, we're at 278. Uh, positive cases, uh, so far this week, we're at 11. Uh, last week we had 13. Um, we still obviously have tomorrow and Saturday to go. So depending on what happens with the Halloween, you know, uptick, we'll see. Uh, regular business, uh, restaurant and food establishment relicensing has been sent out this week. Um, all of them have to resubmit and pay by December 31st for the relicensing. Uh, we continue to see an increase in housing code complaints. Part of that is um, the eviction moratorium's over. So we're getting a lot more complaints um, 
because they're going to court. Uh, we have two active lead cases that are uh, in the process of completion. Uh, the lead's been abated, but we're waiting clearance dust wipes and updated management plans to close those out. I submitted the DPH uh, annual report on Monday, November 1st. They changed the format again on the annual report. It's now just based off the 10 essential services as identified by NATO. So there was nothing in the annual report, believe it or not, regarding COVID and pandemic response, even though that's majority of what local health has been doing. So you just can't make it up. Um, I'm working with Bill Osman on the next FEMA submittal, um, which is for the vaccination clinics. Everything's 100% reimbursed. So that includes the paid staffing, any supplies that we buy for it. Um, and including the utilities of Irwin in the building that we use because it's specific for vaccinations. Um, our, our regular work of soil testing, septic, plan review, building permits, all those things continue to be increased and the construction boom is just continuing to be ongoing, especially with a lot of the new residents coming in wanting to add additions, knock houses down, put in pools, et cetera. So in the real estate transactions, needing the new septic system. So that continues <laughs> to grow. ELC one budget period two, which is my public health nurse grant. I've submitted the financial quarterly report and the progress reports to DPH last week. The FEP grant, which partially funds Dr. Reed's salary, quarterly financial report and progress reports were submitted to our region one coordinator for public health. DPH did notify us on the Wednesday, called the directors of health. They are planning another grant called ELC2 for building capacity in local health. They sent a pre-application survey, which of course I immediately replied and sent back. Um, they do not know the amount of funding yet until they gauge how many health departments want to participate. The preliminary guidance is for, it's to be used for contact tracing, testing and vaccinations, and to utilize another new system they're coming up with called Core CT. We're current, currently we use CTS in contact for all cases and case reporting. So we're gonna have another new system to learn um, regarding contact tracing. Jen, can I just interrupt for just a moment? I'm sorry. Uh, Harrison, I'm wondering if the uh, commissioners can have a discussion on whether to make a recommendation that some of these grants that Jen is having to reapply for every year, um, that we make a recommendation to the selectmen for permanent financing uh, for a couple of these, these areas. Um, I think that given where we are in COVID and given the extensive uh, programs that we have for our residents here um, and the revenue cycle that we have in the town, uh, that some of these positions, I think that we should uh, have a recommendation to, to uh, the town for. Um, I mean, that would be fine, except the procedure with the finance board, et cetera, is to go over everything line item wise. And I'm not sure they would bump this two, three, five years out. Um, I don't know, Jen, do you have anything to say about that? Um, well, the budget guidance for this year, they haven't given us yet from the board of finance, but I do plan on making it clear to the board of finance and town council that, you know, these are grants, especially my, my nurse grant expires next year in the middle of a fiscal year, November, not even the middle, November of 2022. So these are things that I can't do without, you know. So that will we'll go through the budget process that way, but any support would be helpful. <laughs> it's it's Penny. Why, why don't you make a proposal through um, to Kevin and talk about how he would like you to do this. Um, you know, given these are, you know, as Russ was saying, recurring um, grants that you have to keep applying for and applying for and applying for, if there's not some way to, you know, expedite that. Um, 
at least at least toss it around with him and, and see where you know he might come in on some suggestions of how to get through the system okay um it can't hurt <laughs> no let's do that and we'll, re we'll revisit it next month um yeah, i'm currently working with the state immunization program um, regarding enrollment in the connecticut vaccine program cvp and the goal from DPH immunization program is for local health going forward to provide all childhood immunizations in the future, flu, MMR, DTAP, DTAP et cetera, screen for TB, to, to, for gaps in coverage. So, you know, most of New Canaan has, you know, pediatricians, but there are gaps, especially, you know, with Millport and the addition of Canaan Parish, new people coming in. So um, DPH is on an initiative to fill the gaps and um, address anyone that's kind of behind now on the immunization schedule because of COVID. DPH is also doing another initiative they told us on Wednesday with local health, because apparently they think we're bored. Um, through a new infection control program, I'm sure Russ, you know about this, involving nursing homes and assisted living centers, where they would have DP, uh, local health conduct inspections of these facilities for in, in infection control measures um, through either our public health nurses or additional staffing that we would need. Um, there's more to come in the future on what their whole plan is with that. Part of this is coming from our new commissioner, my new boss, is um, from Yale. She's an MD and she specializes in infection control. So they are trying to, at DPH level, identify any gaps in communities and begin to you know, do more programming. But by ways of doing that, unfortunately, a lot of it goes down to local health. So. <laughs> Can you comment or, uh, or Harrison? Uh, on uh, the extent to which infections are a problem right now in these facilities across the state. Well, I'm sure Russ will have you know better firsthand knowledge, but by the charts that they were showing us on Wednesday, you know, especially with the vaccines and the booster doses being done, a lot of um, the obviously the cases are way down across the state in nursing homes and assisted living facilities. And Russ has been clean for a while now. Well, there, there's two things that are going on right now. The first is that last year, and, and it has slowed down a lot uh, due to manpower, but last year we were surveyed uh, three or four times uh, a month. And thankfully, we did not have any tags or, or any issues. Uh, that has not been the case for many long-term care facilities and assisted living facilities, even in uh, Fairfield County. The second where I think we're getting in the squeeze and why I made the motion before for staffing is that the state's uh, actual number of employees and number of nurses uh, have gone down and they cannot find the staff to go into these facilities and do the necessary surveys, especially those that are high risk or have shown a breakthrough or or cases, and we have had a couple, uh, again, in the county uh, of Fairfield that have not been uh, publicly uh, released yet. Thankfully, Waveney has not been one of those. So here again, um, uh, to my initial point, the pressure is being put on the local um, health departments because they do not have the staffing in order to be able to do these inspections that they feel are necessary. So it gets get pushed down continually to uh, the Department of Health, the local Department of Health, and that's why I felt uh, compelled to make a motion for at least permanent financing for the first year or so to, uh, to get through this period. Well, and some of these initiatives like this infection control um, are permanent initiatives that DPH is trying to put in. So, and they're also trying to work on another program that um, about uh, telehealth and telemedicine with local health um, for ch uh, child and maternal health and other gaps. So 
again, <laughs> more given to local health without, you know, the, and again, as a reminder, our town does not receive any per capita funding from the state. We have under 50,000 residents, so we receive zero other than these little grants that I get here and there, where the cities and any town with over 50,000 residents gets per capita funding, meaning they get almost $2 per resident in addition to all this other stuff. So they, you know, I think the state forgets that some smaller towns in Canaan, Darien, Wilton, don't get this other revenue stream and they're putting a lot of burden in addition to COVID on local health to do these initiatives. I mean, they're all great and they're all needed. It's just, you need the bodies to be able to do it all. And, and that's my concern, Jen, like in terms of are they reaching, in your opinion, are they reaching toward regionalizing? I mean, is it? No, that, that's been dead in the water for a long time. Okay, good. Yeah. Because I mean, the, the health districts have shown in the pandemic, they actually had a worse response than local health. I mean, when you have a district like Torrington, you have 16 towns. How are you providing service to your towns? Yeah. You're not. You're not able to do what we do, where we're, you know, doing homebound vaccinations. We're, you know, doing testing every day. We're doing clinics. I mean, if yeah. you look around, there are not even a lot of health departments in the area doing booster clinics because they just can't. We're trying to do everything because our normal jobs are, are being overloaded with the septic and the building permits and all that kind of yeah. stuff. It's, it's crazy. <laughs> yeah. Jen, oh, I have that's... A I'm sorry, go ahead. Yep. No, go ahead, Alicia. Um, is there a demand or are there plans to do additional vaccine clinics for the younger children that are now eligible? Or should people who didn't get an appointment in the first day go elsewhere? No, so once we get through this first phase of the big clinics, we will do what we did before where we have mini clinics in our office every single day. So we set up, I have two substitute school nurses on top of my public health nurse that I have who come and then we do it after school or homebound so they can come after the fact. We do plan on continuing throughout for the weeks, months, whatever it takes. And I've already had some parents reach out to me that have um, children with special needs that you know, that kind of environment is not the best thing for them to go where there's a thousand children. So I'm already making accommodations um, for them as well and plans because, you know, we don't want anybody to, you know, be in a setting that they're not comfortable with, but we, we do plan on doing that as well. So nobody needs to, you know, panic if they don't get into any of these clinics because also the pharmacies are going to be overwhelmed because they can only do X amount a day. And, you know, we don't want to continue to disrupt schools either so it's not like we can be in a school all day either mm -hmm. but no we there will be ample opportunity and for the seniors with the boosters we're just going to need a little patience from everybody while it all gets rolled out because everybody wants to be first but everybody can't be first obviously okay. <laughs> very appreciated I, I have a follow-up question too anecdotally i've been hearing more vaccine hesitancy among parents for this younger group of children. And I was wondering if you or, or Dr. Pierce could speak to the safety of the vaccine and all specifically as to myocarditis, um, what parents should look for if they have concerns, um, you know, to be obviously in talks with their pediatrician, but what to look for. Yeah, when you look at uh, nationally, I've seen numbers of kids who are hospitalized 18 and under there, the numbers range from about 10,000 to 25,000. So it's difficult to put a finger on it. There have been um, probably about 600 to 1,000 deaths with, from COVID in that age grouping. The myocarditis has an incidence of about one per 10,000. Um, it is considered mild, benign, um, with the one caveat that you can't say absolutely forever because you know there are elements of the the long haul COVID that may affect some of these kids that do get it. However, the, the safety of the vaccine relative to the disease itself is like all the other immunizations. You are much better off with than without. Um, so I think that's where we are and that's, um, 
you know, hopefully everyone will jump on. And even though there is the slight risk of that, uh, myocarditis, pericarditis, inflammation, the heart muscle and the surrounding tissue of the heart, it's you're much better off with than without. And um, it's a different formula. It's a pediatric formula. So you're getting a very, very small dose. It's only, you know, 0.1. And that's where too, people don't need to feel rushed and panic that they need to like make this decision tomorrow. You know, we will have the opportunity. So they, you know, if they want to take a little longer to speak to their pediatrician or figure out their own family needs, they can. And then they can reach out to us later and we'll gladly vaccinate them in our office or at home or whatever. And, and with the thousand kids getting the vaccine next week, uh, when do they get their second vaccine? Is that, will there be a follow-up uh, clinic for them? Yep, Thursday, December 2nd will be the public school's um, second dose. And when they come for their first dose, they'll get a vaccine card with the date. And you just, basically the time you signed up for this time is the time next time. I mean, if a few have to change their times, that's not a big deal. We just don't need a thousand people changing their times at the same time. But we do plan on, you know, having, you know, the stickers, the balloon, uh, lollipops, you know, bracelets. And Brian Lutzi and I are planning a surprise. So we do have things that we're working on to try to make it as less intimidating as humanly possible for a clinic. Yeah. We do know how to put on a party. <laughs> Look, I would just say you, you, you guys should be commendable, commended on the level of vac vaccination that we have for those that are under the age of 18. I think it's uh, extraordinary and, and it just goes to show that the efforts that everyone has put into educating families. I think uh, to, to Alyssa's point and to others, um, even when we were first going through the vaccinations uh, process, uh, hard to believe December of 2020 um, coming on the first year, we similarly being the first ones out of the, out of the gate, so to speak, uh, we had a lot of concerns from family members for their, uh, for their seniors, for their parents to being vaccinated. So, uh, do the research. I would just say to families, uh, I agree with Harrison, uh, one in 10,000 is, is, uh, versus the long COVID that we were seeing for some, uh, for some of the residents, in, in our community. Um, I think it's uh, once they become educated uh, and the pediatricians feel comfortable, you got to remember only about 95%, I think, of physicians have been fully vaccinated as well. So we have to continue to educate, make them feel comfortable with the, their decisions. And uh, I think we all should be committed, especially Jen and, and Bethany and, and everyone that works for the town on how, what percentage that we've reached thus to date. So thanks to everyone. When I do think with the holidays coming up, there will be a little different element here that people will be a little more prone to because they want to have the multi-generational holidays. And, you know, and if you look at our cases on the charts on the red box on the website, from May 31st, you know, till now, our number one age bracket in positive cases is the zero to nine-year-olds, believe it or not. I mean, so... The data is there as well. Let the minutes reflect from last time that, that that's what I had said. <laughs> but this week, our, our highest cases are oh, in the last month. Last <laughs> month, I had, said, I had said that was the age group before it happened. And then you said no. You jinxed let me. The, <laughs> let the minutes reflect. I blame you, right. Russ. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. <clears throat> As we know, COVID is still with us. The uh, Connecticut, I think it was Tuesday, there were 425 positives. And uh, you know, it was a little disconcerting. Uh, Noah Hospital, as of last week, had four COVID patients, which is very different than the previous year. There were, one was on a ventilator. They are mostly unvaccinated, um, but occasionally those, especially with comorbidities, age being one of them, um, were developed and, and fully vaccinated were being admitted with COVID symptoms. Um, locally, I mean, this is school, we talked about the youth. So school, as of so far this year, they've had 30 
positives with about 80 quarantined this year. So that is the equivalent of about a week the year prior. So we're seeing clearly an improvement despite COVID still being with us. So it's going in the right direction. The sooner the better. You're telling me, Harrison. <laughs> hey, don't forget, I'm giving us vaccines too. Yes, you are. Uh, You're my number one. Hey, good. Go um, okay. How is the, uh, what's your impression on how it's being spread now? I know that the, the level of infection is relatively low in the area, but it's, people are still catching it. And most, uh, what, most of our cases, and they continue to be, from traveling in large gatherings where they're, they're with people they don't know, you don't know the vaccination status. And then and where we're seeing the little kids get it is they're actually getting it from their parents. So, yeah. you know, which makes sense because you're, you know, in close contact and a little baby isn't gonna be around anyone else but the parents. So continues to be the same, you know, modes of transmission, travel, large gatherings and family. Thank you. Next item on the agenda, Human Services Department, Bethany. Okay, hi everybody. Uh, my report, I'll start with the food pantry. We've got the continued participation uh, with major food drives coming up. The police are doing a food drive. St. A's is doing their huge uh, Love Thy Neighbor food drive uh, and other wonderful smaller organizations that wanna pitch in. So definitely our shelves will be filled for Christmas and the holidays. Um, holiday gift program for the kids. Once again, uh, due to potential, due to continued COVID concerns and inventory of, of toys, we are going to do gift cards again. Like last year, um, meals, the fire department is working with us for the Thanksgiving meals for the homebound. They are also donating uh, fire, uh, the fire department uh, Christmas trees, as well as the Chamber of Commerce, as usual, uh, kindly, generously donates their holiday stroll trees after they're done with their event. And then uh, police and fire are doing a coat drive and we will be, all these items, the coats and the cards and everything will be passed out at the first uh, December distribution for the food pantry. Uh, the police really stepping um, up to the plate with community engagement, uh, working with human services in terms of getting out to lap them, to calls. Uh, they're calling us for help and we're help we're calling them and the, the partnership and collaboration is incredible. And I do think the ultimate goal of helping people that have uh, mental behavioral health issues um, as well as Silver Hill, uh, we're, we're working as a community and excellent, excellent community engagement for the sake of the resident. And grants. So the get about is under the human services department and I attend their meetings each month. The, the have they submitted to the town a potential request for a new van, which costs about $60,000. Um, because of the isolation issues due to COVID and because they can only do one person at a time to single events, um, such as uh, medical appointments and things, they're asking for another van. These vans, they can only take so many thousands of miles and then they just start falling apart, which I've learned through being on this board. So hopefully the town will look at that. Um, so we've been writing that potential uh, request. And also there is Tiger Man made me aware of a Connecticut low income household water assistance program. And actually we do have a few clients and possibly more residents that could benefit from having the vendor or organization, which would be under the town, uh, getting payment through an energy assistance source, which our catchment area would be the uh, Connecticut uh, Community Action for Western Connecticut. So I'm working on that application process with Lunda to sign so that these people, they will not have to pay the sewage waste fee, which can range between 
let me see. Thank you, Bob Mantilia, for giving me this information. Can range between two hundred and seventy-five to seven hundred and thirty-five dollars a year, which is very much. Um, people have come in uh, saying that it's definitely a financial burden on them. So hopefully, we can get that taken care of. Flu clinics, great success of the four hundred flu shots. I have ten high dose left and twenty regular. Um, we'll, we're still giving out to police, fire, other employees, as well as residents. Um, we've donated some to EMS, uh, ABC House, we vaccinated, which we do every year. We've continued the home visits um, and appointments at Human Services. People just plan on doing this every year. So it, it's, it's a great turnout and down to just a few left. The employee health fair, we had over 100 employees come and with, for flu shots, as well as massages and reflexology and paraffin hand dip. And so it was a great success. We will do it again next year in, in, in uh, coinciding with the flu clinic. And what else? Choices, the Part D drug enrollment for Medicare is currently underway and Marcy and I are choices counselors. So we are helping people choose their next year's drug program uh, enroll and enrolling them in it. That's working out well. We have the continued blood pressure clinics at Lapham and Schoolhouse. And not only does this help with their wellness, but um, in terms of physical wellness, but also mental, it's a wonderful time. Marcy comes with me, we do it together. Uh, the numbers are increasing, they're doubling of what we do, and it's a time to talk to them and they can feel they can talk to us about other issues and we can send them to other important resources in the town as well as the uh, outside local area. The ribbon cutting at Canaan Parish took place. It was fantastic in terms of the move. It's being started last week. The, the clients and the residents of Canaan Parish are moving into their new into their new uh, address right across the road, not row, but driveway from where they were before. People, uh, everyone's doing an amazing job from the management company to the residents themselves. They're getting situated. Uh, we've had some behavioral health issues. Uh, we've taken care of uh, mobile crisis has been amazing. They've been out there to help people uh, get acquainted with their new surroundings. Um, at that real time of moving when the moving companies come. So the apartments are beautiful. Uh, that New Canaan Housing Authority has done an unbelievable job. And um, that seems to be rolling. Everything's rolling and putting out fires where they may be. Um, that's it. Bethany, um, you mentioned about the get about having a, a limit of one person per ride. Uh, do you see... Uh, is that something that is, a couple of questions, is that something that is get about its policy or some sort of a government mandate? And secondly- oh, well, during COVID, It's for, for medical appointments, it's hard, you know, you've got to do one at a time or with their, with their aid. If they have an aid, definitely the aid is included as well. Um, but the one person that the, even, in terms of going to like Lapham, yeah. groups and things, they can now have, more than one because they're already going into a public place. Uh, but the number of people that have been isolated for the past 18 months, um, they are starting to get out now and some more than usual, they want to get out, which is great. We wanna promote that. And, but at the same time, it's limited to the number of vans. Okay. And there, but we're increasing, good about is increasing now beyond what they were pre-COVID. Okay. And so we need Bethany, I would just, I would hand. just, I would just offer up that uh, we have a couple of vans and because of COVID as well, they're underutilized. And while you're going through the grant process, if we want to have a, a separate meeting, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy and willing to do that and help support them until the grant uh, gets set up, if we can work that out together. So um, happy to meet and discuss. Okay. Yeah. I'll let, I'll let, uh, Bill, uh, was it Bill, uh, the new president? No, and then yeah, they can. Great, thank you, Russ. Thank you, Bethany. Um, uh, Marcy Rand is meeting with Dr. Gerber, the president of uh, 
it's over Hill this morning. So she do you have, did she leave anything for you to present Bethany? Yeah, I do have um, Marcy's write up. She is, she's done, she's continues with the energy assistance applications. She's done over 20. Uh, she continues the visits to Lapham on Wednesdays and Thursdays. Um, she is doing a, a life reimagined group and that has gone from under 10 to over 18 now. And it's just about getting older. She does it with a, another social worker who is uh, a resident here and um, in her 80s and a social, you know, licensed social worker still. So it's a wonderful combination. The two of them are doing well. And then she uh, continues uh, attending the virtual rounds through the uh, Norwalk Hospital and uh, focusing on seniors, isolation issues. It's a wonderful meeting spot and learning more resources. Um, she has, continues the coffee with a cop this month. They are doing scams uh, at Lapham. So very relevant issues are being brought up. She's working very closely with the New Canaan Police and Mobile Crisis Unit for quite for a few residents that are have, having mental health health issues. And once again, I want to reiterate, um, Andrew Gerber and, and his staff have been incredible. Uh, we work very well together, and the relationships are just you know getting stronger every day. She is. Uh, we worked very extensively on a, a resident with a resident who needed, who was displaced by a fire in town, Red Cross came out and that is all being uh, mitigated. That was wonderful working with Red Cross. Uh, she's currently working with multiple organizations uh, in terms of a very complicated conservatorship that is taking place right now. And uh, these are this happens for very mentally ill residents. Um, so she has requested and received amazing help from Silver Hill, uh, Dr. Gerber, and uh, the two of them have made, uh, he, he has made himself immediately available to us and uh, obviously the town human services is very grateful. What else? Uh, just everything is full and functioning. And as she stated before, the uh, situations and the cases that she's doing are getting very complicated, but she is seeing them through to the resolution phase and uh, just uh, grateful that she's there, as well as Jackie, who will also give her report and she's doing phenomenal things as well. Thank you, Bethany. Uh, Jackie. Hi everyone, I'm Jackie DeLui. I'm the Youth and Family Services Coordinator. It's good to see everyone. Um, yes, so I um, wanted to follow up on my um, fuel assistance trickle in. I think what's been tricky is, um, you know, it's just families with school kids. It's it's hard. But the good thing about them is a lot of them don't heat with like oil. So the nice thing about doing those applications early is that you get a lot, like you get a basic benefit, a crisis benefit, some safety nets, which might help you throughout the whole season, which is great. But for my clients that heat with the Eversource natural gas um, or propane or something, that's a or Eversource electric, that's a one-time lump sum of money that just goes directly to the vendor. So technically they could apply in April and it would have no different benefit to them if they applied first thing in November. So I, I tend to, we'll have a, probably a rush closer to the spring. I've done several that do heat with oil and, and thus, you know, and they're getting good. The, the money actually is more than it's been at the end of the year, we'll know how much um, benefited our clients in town, but um, it's great that they're you know, the money actually has gone up. So that's amazing. And I think um, income limits, like those have gone up a little bit too. So more people are qualifying. Um, so we always tell people to, you know, just apply anyway, even if they got denied, maybe next year, it'll move those brackets up. Um, we've had about, I'm working with three new families. One has been brought in through just moving into the um, Canaan Parish new. So it's a new family. Um, and then two of the other ones, um, you know, have lived in town and either, you know, money is, they've run out, maybe employment issues. One's a, a single mom with two kids and just part-time employment. Um, so those are, that's great, you know, that they've found their way to us. Um, 
So we'll be helping them. Hopefully they're in early enough that we can maybe get them added to our holiday wish list um, to help those kids. Uh, Bethany had mentioned Christmas trees. We have 16 that we can give out. So 14 of those will go to families and two will go to older citizens, mainly because the older um, people, you know, they just don't want the mess in their home. Um, so we end up giving them more, more to families. Um, St. A's always asks us for a list every year that they can give out, um, you know, financial support to families in town in need. So I've been able to refer eight families for that. Um, and now we're sending an email out to our families about gift cards for the holiday, and we'll give them till next Friday um, to let us know what they're interested in. And that's been really great for them because then they can go out and get gifts for the kids. Um, so they actually like the gift cards. Um, tomorrow, actually, I'm, we've had to put off the date a couple of times due to weather, but I'm doing a bullying awareness um, at Saks at lunch. Uh, we're giving out bracelets that go along with their charter of caring. So, you know, they're great. They say sex cares and the caring starts with me. Um, and we're doing, they're going to be able to draw bookmarks with the caring sort of, um, you know, notion. Um, so that'll be great. Kids love it. I wish we could do it all the time. We're actually going to do that outside. So it's going to be a little cold, probably at 10 a.m. if you look at the temperature now, but it's fine. The kids um, really love these efforts. So we hope to, Sachs has been willing to get us back in there um, and the high school has always been willing. Um, also, if anyone has saw the pinwheels, I, I had, we took them out on November 1st, but um, they were on library property and the library, um, children's librarians told me they got so much interest and inquiries about what those pinwheels were for. So I would love to do it there again if construction allows for that. Um, so that was great. That was such a hit to have. I thought they looked beautiful. Um, and actually, just by coincidence, there was a, a you know, Jennifer Dulos heart just under that tree. And that was no, we didn't plan that at all. That just is how it worked out. So it gave me goosebumps that day when we, when the kids and I saw that um, it's, it was a seventh grade NCL group. Um, we um, I've continued to always work with, I don't know if I give her enough credit, but um, Lizette D'Amico is the ESL director for the district of New Canaan public schools. Like she's always available to support families, um, you know, that come in from another country and might need help, you know, with many, many things. So we connect a lot. I feel like she is the one that pulled together the, um, we did a, an event at Millport for welcome back to school for East. Um, and that was back in like September. And I had mentioned, but she was really instrumental in that. I know that the hope would be using a community room at either Canaan Parish or Millport at some point to have those kids that live there have some kind of after school program, which would be amazing for those families, you know, to not have the financial burden. Also, we don't have enough space for after school. We use the Y, the daycare of New Canaan. They've been limited with numbers due to COVID or financially, um, it's a lot of money to pay for that. So if we could do that, that would be great. And I know the school would support that. And I think the library has been willing to um, come in and read or whatever the program. So that's going to be in the future, but I would love that to happen. Um, I've had some referrals. Obviously, they always come in for counseling, um, having to get creative with families because a lot of these therapists have, um, you know, caseloads, but we're always working on, you know, getting new referral sources. And then if anyone knows the right program, which is a reaching independence through employment out of family centers, I'm continuing to send folks there because I think a lot of them are coming to the end of any unemployment and really need to get back out there and work. Um, and those uh, caseworkers there have been great. They have, they're working day in and day out in the employment, helping people find stuff. So they have resume writing and all these tips might even have referral sources for jobs. Um, so that's a good one. And then last but not least, I met via Zoom, the new um, Kids in Crisis um, teen talk counselor at the high school. His name is Greg Sloan. He was retired from the New Rochelle school system as a director of guidance and has had a lot of great, I mean, he's such an asset to our community. 
Um, he's hit the ground running. I was going to give him a little more time before I introduce him to you guys. I think he's only maybe in his third week, um, but he's already had interest with kids at the high school wanting to start a mental health club. And I know for some of us that really know the need there, I, that was amazing to me. So I, and he'd obviously be the facilitator of that um, and he'll keep me posted, but we know that when it comes from kids, you know, the peer to peer support is huge and he can just guide them along. But I loved hearing that. Um, and I think we continue to look for someone to fill uh, the slot at Saks. They did have a candidate come forward and I don't think they went ahead with that person. So, but just really happy to introduce you guys to Greg. So maybe we'll do that for the new year. Um, and if anyone has any questions, you can ask me now or contact me whenever. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Jackie, for all that you do. Um, it uh, It's coming up to our board for our board review and approval. Um, but we're going to be opening up a nursing school on Three Farm Road. And so um, we actually pay our students. Uh, that will start uh, December 1st. So if someone wants to have a nursing career, um, we will pay them while they're going to school and while they're working. Um, we will help them through um, other career resources um, to bring them on. So if anyone in town is interested, Rebecca Albrecht, if you want to contact me later, would be the person to reach out to. Uh, but if anyone's having employment issues and wants a career uh, as a nurse, uh, we're going to start the school. We're going to employ them from day one. We're going to help them with daycare. Wow. Oh, that, I was going to ask that. Oh, this is and, terrific. And, and, and everything else um, and to, to start uh, hiring, hiring nurses from day one, training them, and then uh, providing wow. careers for them. So uh, that will start December 1st. And uh, again, subject to board approval from Waveney, um, we're starting to take applicants now. So um, I'll just- would, Russ, Russ, would Rebecca, I'm sorry, just one question. Would Rebecca have like a little write-up? Because I will actually send it to- my clients that um, I have a lot that are like home health aides or, you know, and probably have thought I could never, you know, do something like that. So if I could, I've reached out to her before, I think for employment. So if I have her reach her, out to me, okay. you reach out to me and I'll make the connection. But uh, again, we're starting that employment uh, December 1st um, yeah. and taking on the first 12 students, or if they've already are CNAs and home health aides and they want to become nurses, and we can work Great. with them to get oh, to the next it. level. Okay. Russ, this is Tom. A couple of comments. Would you uh, describe the credential, the types of uh, nursing credentials that we're training for? Is it RNs, LPNs, or, or what? And second, I would suggest that once the program is approved and launched, that you give a little bit, you or somebody from Waveney give a more in depth uh, review at a future commission meeting. So. Yeah, it is, it is all levels, Tom. It is uh, uh, cert certified nurses aides, it's home health aides, it's LPNs, it is RNs, it's BSNs. Uh, so they can come into any entry point. Um, the, the lowest entry point is just having a GED and, um, and uh, you know, being fingerprinted and making sure there's no criminal history and uh, physical and and background. So we will hire you on day one and put you through the training program and pay you during that. And also uh, you'll have a full-time job with benefits starting out. So uh, if someone comes to us as an LPN, of course, they'll be able to work right away. And then we will pay for their education to get their, their RN degree. So it's a new program. Um, I'm sorry to be self-promoting here, but as we talk about employment issues, uh, in our community, uh, we felt we needed to reach out and and uh, help that need. Jackie, you you mentioned had a question for Jackie. You mentioned about this program, uh, right? And uh, yes, and you, are you are, unfamiliar with it? No, I hadn't heard about it. But my question is this: in the current market, um, it's really easy to find work. I think. Am I? Sure. And, so uh, obviously you have to do a good job, so you, you keep your job, but uh, at least getting, uh, getting hired, uh, it, are we finding that people are still having trouble getting employment? I remember a few years back, uh, finding jobs was a big deal and we had support groups and everything helping people. But in this uh, world that we're in now, I would think it would be uh, 
easy and, and, and that program should be quite mm -hmm. successful in helping place people. Uh, what are you seeing? Well, so I think, you know, that program definitely can get someone that's like, you know, because they help with resume writing and, you know, you don't want to have every right. single job on there that you've ever done. You, you, you know, if you're looking in a specific, specific niche or, you know, I, I think jobs that are definitely you're seeing out there are a lot of service industry restaurants are, are, you know, in need, you know, so I think people I'm finding they're still a little hesitant to go back into a job like that, you know, with lots of exposure to lots of people. But um, but with this program, maybe someone that's been a mom and out of the um, workforce for a while and feels uncomfortable, they really coach them and help them to feel, you know, more secure about and confident to get back there. Um, but again, any host of re reasons um, they can contact this. It's just such a great resource that Family Centers provides. I mean, it's always been a referral source of mine. Um, and I've heard oh, always here, wow, I didn't know that I was just submitting these resumes, you know, and never looked at certain, you know, criteria on that. And I haven't applied for a job in a really long time. I probably wouldn't know what should be on there, you know, and these people know it because they're working with the clients, the employers. Um, and again, they can sometimes offer, they're also working with the employers. So maybe there, Ross, someone I can put you in touch with, um, Jessica, who's one of the directors there, just to, you know, about the nursing school, because I think it would be great for them to know about that program. Um, but it just really, and it's free, Tom. So like, you know, for someone to get all this help for free um, and have someone really support them is, is great. So, but exactly. yeah, I do we're, think we're it should be easier. You know, thanks to thanks to Jim Lisher and all of his efforts, uh, we're working with Career Resources, which okay. is a statewide statewide program, awesome. and they also have free programs on developing life skills, uh, life skill training, um, and all of those things as well. So I think this is a great time for our community, you know, to collaborate with some of these these services and. Uh, as Tom um, indicated, uh, you really shouldn't, if someone need, wants a job, they should be able to find a job in our community and, and we should be able to help them do that. Yeah, and Catholic Charities too is incredible. Uh, as people have asked, do you have to be Catholic? And that, no, no, that's a wonderful uh, point of resource for all these other things too. So it's great resources out there. One, one thing, that's coming along that we observe at career resources on a statewide basis is there's a lot of people that are very slow coming back into the employment business, having been subsidized by the government for the last several months. And they're, they're having to finally come back, but it's still very slow. And we don't expect until the early part of the year that the, a lot of these jobs will finally be filled. I mean, there, there is no shortage of work but getting people uh, out into, and there's this con concern continuing over COVID, but I think that's once the younger kids get vaccinated, et cetera, that will go away. But nevertheless, it, again, a major social changes are going on here and, and employment's kind of the last thing that's getting uh, attention, but it's coming. And, and Jackie, I would just say, you know, in health care, which is a 24-7 business, if someone can only work weekends or someone can only work evenings because of whatever their situations are, that's, that's what we want to do. And I think Jim is alluding to, we want to be able to assist them in whatever shifts that they can work and however they can fit that within their own lifestyle, uh, that we're able to, to afford them the ability to do that. Great. Um, Jackie, I don't think you have to worry about any resume prep. But I think you're staying where you are. <laughs> if, if, if you could hear me, is anyone else having problems with reception on this Zoom? No, the, the, no, we we've, we've all got a copy of Jackie's resume. Thank you. <laughs> okay, sounds good. Um, and Russ, kudos to you for kickstarting this nursing education program. Hope it's successful. Thank you. Um, so we will segue into um, old business, kids in crisis. Jackie did address that. Um, the feedback I've gotten from the high school is very positive with Greg Sloan. I did uh, 
have contacted to um, Kids in Crisis, Sherry, who's their administrator, to get a, an appropriate CV to present to you, but have not gotten a response. There's also been no word on any connection with or, or success in finding someone for SACS. Do you know anything about that, Jackie? Yeah, I had said there was a candidate that they had interviewed maybe uh, a maybe month you're back, not hearing and me. they didn't go forward with that person. Um, yeah. and, but I don't know if people trickle in all the time. I would imagine they have people. I just I've just looked at my email uh, multitasking here and Sherry from Kids in Crisis said they do have an interview for a middle school uh, okay. teen talk yeah. counselor hoping next week. I mean, so maybe we'll, you know, there's movement forward. Okay, Great. sounds good. Um, in fact, this uh, new person, Greg Sloan, they've compared him to Ed, whomever, whom I didn't know, ah, but- uh, That's great. Had very, very positive comments about him through, and he was here for multiple years, correct? One issue we've had with the kids in crisis counselor at the high school, they've been here for a year or two and then gone. So it's well, I not joked ideal. with him. I joked with him. I um, said, you know, could you, if you could sign item, a contract. Business, but... it... oh. Can you guys, how are you not hearing me? I'm on Marcy's expensive computer. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> Wait, I, I hear you fine. Oh, you hear yeah. me? It's, it's, yeah. Har it's Dr. Harrison. Harrison. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. For once, it's not me. No. Um, no, but I was, I joked with Greg about signing a contract, but he's, you know, he's retired and he said he's got a son in middle school that's got eight more years. So he's not looking to go anywhere. So if he could get us eight years, that would be really, really oh, great. God, yeah. So hopeful, hopeful. He's yeah, great he, though. He really is. Is he full time at New Canaan yes. High? Yes, yes. Thank you. You're welcome. Jackie, is his son a student in the system here in New Canaan? I'm sorry, say that again. Uh-oh. Is his son a student here in New Canaan? No, he's from like Irvington or like Westchester. Like so, and he had worked for New Rochelle. Interestingly enough, very different school, you know, different school system, different problems. I think he said there was a student death when he was there, you know, like I think there was a student murdered another student. So obviously a very different community, but, um, you know, the needs and the issues, you know, the kids still need the same thing. So he was, you know, he likes the challenge of, and he's been, there's been a very warm recept reception. I've heard great things from counselors. He's followed up with them immediately after working with kids, he's getting a lot of referrals. So, but the mental health group would be, I mean, phenomenal. And that really needs to be, I think, student driven. So I, that would be just huge. And he's got a lot, like I said, he was the director of guidance for the new, you know, new Rochelle school system, but he didn't love the administration. He likes the direct service with the kids. So right. he's where he needs to be. So we got to keep him. <laughs> Sounds good. Um, next item is the American Rescue Plan Act. Kevin is not on this morning, correct? I don't see him, Harrison, oh, no. no. So he, he proposed because of the American Rescue Plan Act that the town had uh, $6 million. I don't know if he mentioned that big number, but uh, and 250,000 of it, he wanted to distribute through Health and Human Services and had mentioned doing something with Silver Hill, had spoken to Dr. Gerber about it. Um, so that was introduced at the last meeting. Um, Bethany and I, and I have tossed it around about what's the best way to handle this and if we did something with Silver Hill would we make it would it be need based um, should it be Silver Hill as opposed to Norwalk or Stanford or Greenwich or Yale or whatever um, we we did have questions about all these things um, and if it is and as we've mentioned 250,000 can go away very quickly um, just due to insurance coverage or lack of it for a lot of psychiatric conditions, especially if there's inpatient and even ongoing outpatient is uh, becomes problematic. So um, open to suggestion, um, I think 
we did mention, you know, we were looking for funding for these the guidance counselors at uh, through kids, both for New Canaan High School and Sachs, and we were able to come up with some funding. And perhaps this money should be used for that to keep it going for the next couple of years at both schools. That would take care of the 250,000 um, and it would be well spent. Of course, that only deals with youth, be it middle school and high school and not the geriatric population or others that are in need too, so. Well, um, Harrison, the school system also directly received CARES um, American Rescue Act funding as well. So to keep that in mind, they received almost a million dollars themselves directly. Yeah, I'm not sure that goes to, can go to kids in crisis though, because I think they wanted it to it's be- It's the same parameters as distinct. the town. Do you know funding. anything about that, Bethany? So I know the Board of Ed has agreed to pay through the ARPA funds, two years of the middle school yeah. counselor for the teen talk counselor. Um, and that's it. Um, but we need to keep this up for the middle school, the high school. Um, but other than that, we have always covered, uh, human services has always covered the teen talk counselor because it is separate from the board of ed. Um, thank goodness for these ARPA funds. And they decided to do that because they felt it was needed as well. But after that, um, yeah, it, it, it's coming from the same pot, but the Board of Ed will probably use it differently. I mean, they will not continue covering kids in crisis. They have their own counselors. Harrison, I, I, um, we, Waveney had filed uh, an ARPA grant for telehealth, which included uh, telepsychiatry and other things. So I have to recuse myself from the discussion uh, regarding the funding of ARPA. So excuse me for that. Um, however, I would say some of these uh, programs, I still feel strongly about, I understand going back to Kevin, I still feel strongly about that need to be funded on a regular basis through our town, our town budget um, as compared to, you know, special allocations. So um, again, I recuse myself for the allocation of ARPA funds, but uh, Stu still reiterate um, my support as commissioner uh, for regular funding for some of these uh, these needs that are ongoing. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, would uh, funding the cost of a get about van uh, meet the test here? It, it depends what the town, I mean, it, it, to the town's discretion. Yeah. Uh, it it's a it's a sing it's it's an an entity that operates on its own, and the town does charge. The good about has to pay them each month. Yeah, but it's so I don't know the in terms of what the call for the ARPA what what the conditions are. But that's can, what I, can about. I interject? It, it's Penny. Can I interject? Because I sit on that committee from the town council. Uh, and I suggest that you get in touch with Mark Jimsky, who's uh, overseeing um, that committee. Um, we have, uh, as you could imagine, a lot of requests. Um, <laughs> I mean, when you got money, everybody all of a sudden's got a need, right? Exactly. <laughs> so let me put this. Um, I can't see everybody with the sun in my face. Um, we, we have established some um, pretty broad uh, guidelines, but they're at the same time pretty specific. You know, they're, they're issues that were identified through COVID um, as uh, something that we um, had as a program and found that we, you know, had more of a need for it or there were programs that need to be developed because we saw we had a hole, you know, in service provision. Um, and so I, I think you really need to get in touch with Mark and really, really understand where he's going with the guidelines um, on, on all this. Uh, I don't think they can be programs that you uh, have an assumption that need to be funded year after year after year, because that's not what that kind of money is being 
you know, identified to provide. Hey, Penny, if yeah. you're on that committee, I had asked Kevin last week when he proposed, or last month, when he proposed this idea, how long we had as a commission to respond to the opportunity. Is there a, a, a door drop time that this committee that you're on from the council is going to uh, say, okay, we're finished accepting options. We're now- Yeah, we're, try we're, try we're trying to get this done in, in, by December, in, in December, right? In so December. Ser seriously, I, w I, I want you to get in touch with Mark Jimsky, you know, personally um, to see whether or not this is gonna fit in the guidelines that he has articulated. Uh, from the committee, it's not just you know Mark, but but he, the buck stopped with him right now, and um, so um, I mean I don't want you to go through a whole lot of you know proposal writing if it's not going to you know go anywhere. Right. No, a good um, point. Yeah, you know okay. I mean because no, I know I know what it takes. I mean everybody's got great ideas. And they're all issues that need to be funded somehow, sometimes, some way, you know, um, as to whether or not ARPA funds are, you know, really the one, the funding source that identifies you, you know, or fulfills a need um, under those guidelines. I, I really want you to, you know, get in touch with Mark before right. you're spending more energy on it. Uh, and I'll let, him, I'll let him know that it's coming. Great. Right. Thank you, Penny. That will be, yep. I think that will, that will answer this issue for the moment. Um, <laughs> under new business, late addition that Lance Miner's term is retiring as a member of Health and Human Services. We will certainly miss him. He's been a great source for everything related to alcohol, substance abuse, et cetera. Um, we Every year between Thanksgiving and Christmas, we do have notices in the advertiser about uh, just awareness of alcohol levels, partying, intoxication, et cetera. And um, we thought last year that maybe we should do something different this year, although I personally didn't have a problem. I sort of thought it was good to have that as a reminder to all parents, kids, et cetera, in the advertiser, although the the uh, subscription rate with the advertiser is probably not what it was, um, but nevertheless, it is a source of communication. Um, Bethany had mentioned something that about, you know, we thought maybe we should redo the little notices that are put in the paper. Um, any input from any of you regarding that? Hi, it's Alyssa McKenzie, Commissioner. Um, I think two years ago, I had worked with Liz Donovan on um, updating the graphics. So if there's anything we wanna do there and pretty much anytime I do any graphic for the town, I always send it along to Bob Doran who somehow is everywhere. Um, <laughs> and he puts it up on channel 79. So if there's anything we'd wanna do with that, he's um, so creative and so willing to collaborate. So just let me know where you want me on that one. If you do. Definitely. Alyssa, could you, um, yeah, let's, as a starter, if you could do something or just make some suggestions. Do you have the old copies of what was put in the advertiser? Yep. All right, yeah. let's, um, why don't you, Bethany and I connect with this in the next week and then we'll, uh, we'll move forward and we'll let the commission know. Perfect. Okay. Any other new business? Okay, I think it's, it is time. May I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Motion, second. second. All in favor, aye. Okay. Aye. Thank you so much again for attending. And our next meeting will be on December 2nd at 8.45, continuing to be Zoom, um, at least for the near future. And, uh, have a great Thanksgiving, everyone. Thank you. Yeah, everyone. Thank you. Thank, thank, you. All, thank, thank you. you all, staff, thank for you all you all. do. Thank you. Happy Thanksgiving. Thank yeah. you. And I'm going to stop recording now. Thank you.